Uh, how many of you uh, appreciate how Bishop Peter loves to serve and bless other people? Amen. It's true, isn't it? Hanging, hanging around Bishop Peter, it's contagious. You know, you'll you'll either run from Peter or you'll get a servant's heart. And the longer you listen to Bishop Peter, the more you'll realize that you have blind spots. How many of you have blind spots? Yeah, and I've been listening to Peter's preaching four and a half years, and boy, have I got a lot of blind spots. Sometimes God even wants me to deal with it. How many of you believe that life can be messy? How about marriage? Is that ever messy? Oh, yeah. Family? Yeah. Church? Yeah. yeah. What about healing? Can that ever be messy? Uh, Janice Inch, um, who is a uh, counselor, I was just talking to her, and uh, we both agreed that quick fixes don't work. If you came today for a quick fix that's going to solve all your problems, you've come to the wrong church. I mean. Yeah, but we all like quick fixes when we're in pain. It's like politically. Have you noticed how often nations in crisis want it all over whatever? You know, uh, Europe, you know, almost every nation uh, was democratic, but it was so messy. Democracy is very messy. Almost every nation in Europe in the 1930s uh, went into totalitarianism be, because freedom of choice and democracy is very messy. It can be very, very painful. I heard a noise. So I want to ask you, did you come today with great expectations? Think of Charles Dickens regarding what God is coming, going to do today. Yes. Yeah, what are you expecting? Just want a few of you to share. What are you expecting God to do today? Bring me peace. Yeah, bring you peace. Holy Spirit fall. The Holy Spirit falling. You know, it, it's very, how many of you realize the Holy Spirit indwells you as a believer? Yeah, but the Bible says we, we can quench the Spirit, even as Christians. We can grieve the Spirit. We can vex the Spirit. We can resist the Holy Spirit. Remember Stephen. When he was being killed, he said, you're just like your fathers, hard-hearted and resisting the Holy Spirit. Even Christians can be hard-hearted and resist the Holy Spirit. That's part of the reason communion can make you sick. If, if you take communion and you're, you're full of bitterness and unforgiveness. The Bible says it will make you sick. It can even kill you. Peter will have to take your funeral. So taking communion is not 
some nice little ritual. It can either kill you or it can heal you. Yeah, you're in an attitude of repentance. If you receive that uh, in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. So many Christians receive everything with grumbling. By faith with grumpiness. Have you ever met a grumpy Christian? There's lots of them. Self-righteous, grumpy, even nasty Christians. Sometimes Christians in politics, people avoid us because we have all the answers and we're very self-righteous. So, but expectations often, they shape what we receive. Are there any pregnant mothers out there that you know of, David? Yeah. Does it affect women? Yeah, it affects everything. And pregnant mothers are often called expectant mothers. Expectant. What is, it? what does it mean to be expectant? You know, people often say, if they want to protect you, if you get excited about something, don't get your hopes up. You ever been told that? You'll just be disappointed. And some people say, I feel better now that I stop caring. So a lot of people in our culture are very nihilistic. They reject everything. They reject authority. They reject morality. They reject truth. And they, have, they try to live with no excitations. And it's the way of death, isn't it? We all need hope. Hope we need. We actually, so I want to challenge you today, get your hopes up. But not in the flesh, in the spirit. You see, hope is about expectation. What are the three things that we need? Faith, Faith hope, and love. And the Bible talks about hope as an anchor. And because life is messy and healing, is often messy. You need to have a hope like an anchor. Healing doesn't always go like we want it to, when we want it to. It's messy. It's humbling. And it's easy for people that are just want to just give up on it. Just say, oh, it's the wrong dispensation. Jesus doesn't heal anymore. Drop your expectations. But the Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. He hasn't turned the tap off. The healing ministry is still operative. Remember, Jesus is threefold ministry, preaching, teaching, healing the sick. He gave that to the 12, then to the 72, and to all of us. The healing ministry is still for today. So I want to challenge you, if you've been disappointed, if you prayed for people and it hasn't gone, I want you to dare to believe again for a breakthrough. The word expectation is a 16th century uh, word in Latin, which means what are you looking out for? So hope. So today, what are you looking for? If you come here, expecting nothing, you may get what you're expecting. <clears throat> but say, God, give me expectant eyes. How many of you have read any of Fyodor Dostoevsky? Yeah, I'm, I'm on a Russian writer's kick. You may have noticed. And Dr. G.I. Packer, after he was run over by a truck and had a brain injury, he couldn't play football. So he read books, and he was, at age 13, a Dostoevsky addict. That's how he described himself. And he said it helped him understand people. So here's what Dostoevsky uh, said about the protagonist. Alyosha, an amazing person, in Brothers Karamazov, it says in the book, he had expectant eyes. You have expectant eyes. And it initially irritated 
his older brother, Ivan, who was very worldly, but he grew fond of his brother's expectant eyes. Do you have a family member with expectant eyes, expecting God to do something? Isn't that wonderful? If your eye, because we live in a so cynical, jaded, negative culture, and the last three and a half years haven't exactly helped, have they? Because people who are already grumpy and negative, like many Christians, often just got worse. So I'm going to ask you a trick question, and this actually relates, so humor me. Is the Anglican Church Catholic or a Protestant? Yes. Yeah, you got it. The answer is yes. Um, we, we are Reformed Catholics be, because I'm 13% Irish. Um, I even before I knew Jesus, I <clears throat> I knew I wasn't Catholic. And in the Anglican Church, we often say the creed, and we say one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. And I wouldn't say the word Catholic. I'd say the rest of it. I never had any doubts about the creed, but I knew I wasn't a Catholic. It's very interesting. So the things can be very deep in your family. We didn't have any Catholics in our family. All Saints Church, as part of the England mission, is a three-stream church, Catholic, Evangelical, and Charismatic, in the best sense. And what this means, we focus in Christ on sacrament. That's why we have Holy Communion and baptism, the gospel sacraments. The word, we read the scripture, we preach on it. And spirit, we pray for the sick. There's something very powerful about, about the word, the sacrament and the spirit together. And sadly, you don't often see all three operative in most churches. You may have heard the word without the spirit, you dry up. The spirit with, without the word, you blow up. <coughs> and the word, spirit, and sacrament together, you grow up. That's Bishop Peter's heart, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Peter is passionate about us growing up and becoming more childlike, not childish. Growing up. So, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have a Bible that you read? Raise your hand if you have a Bible that you read. How many of you have an Anglican prayer book? Yeah, all ten of you. It's very interesting. First of all, if you have Bibles, um, the, the good news is it's all online. So if you don't have an English prayer book, you just Google it. <clears throat> I, I was in Montreal uh, when I was in grade six and seven. And in Montreal, the Anglicans there, they were evangelical. And we actually read the Bible. And so I read through all the Old Testament. I loved it. I loved the violence especially. And then we moved back to Vancouver and uh, our ex-diocese was Anglo-Catholic, which meant none of us read the Bible. It's very interesting. And uh, I didn't have a Bible. None of my friends had Bibles. When being confirmed, I, I was taught all about the prayer book, which is a wonderful book, but nothing about the Bible. And I, I was taught about catechism, which is the basics. Um, now, the good news is the prayer book, which most of you have probably never read, is 80% quotes and passages from the Bible. So it, it's good stuff. Nobody told me that 
the Anglican Prayer Book has on page 587, if you're looking for it, has a very powerful 11 page healing service. It's absolutely profound. Has anyone read it? Raise your hand if you read. <clears throat> There's all two of you. It, it's really profound. And the sad thing in many churches, whether Catholic, Protestant, or whatever, we've forgotten our healing heritage. Yeah, or we may believe it, but it's non-functional. I mean, I never doubted anything, but the healing ministry for me, it, it was on the radar screen. If you're sick, what do you do? You go to the doctor. I never imagined church had anything to do with being healthy. If I want to be healthy, maybe go to the gym. <clears throat> now, in this amazing uh, 11 pages, there is laying on hands, which we're going to do today. Healing prayers, we're doing that today. Reading and healing scriptures, we did that today. Like James chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. Now, James chapter 5 says, if anybody is sick, what are they supposed to do? Well, my version was different. If anyone is sick, wait for the Anglican priest to visit and complain if he ignores you. That was my version. But the Bible says, if anybody is sick, bother, you bother the elders. Call up, you don't wait for Peter. If you're sick, I, I visited people with cancer. They've apologized, taking my time. I don't want to bother Peter. He's too big bother the elders. I visited a family at St. Philip's First Church I served in, and they were so angry, just angry, 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 because their daughter was sick with cancer, and they kept waiting for the church to visit so they could tell her that she was sick and she died before we got there. We had 1,200 people on our rolls, and we were visiting systematically. She died before we got to her alphabetical number, and they were so angry. And that's why I, I think, James, if anybody's sick, you don't wait, call. If somebody in your family dies before Peter gets there, and you didn't tell him, it's on you. Do you hear what I'm saying? It gets very true. And it says in James 5, they will anoint you with, with oil and the birth they will heal the sick. If anyone has any sins or faults, confess them one to another and pray for each other. They may be healed because the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I'm believing for powerful and effective prayers today where we're going to be anointing you with oil today. So, here's a prayer from the Anglican Healing Service, just to whet your interest. You can Google it. Here it is. Oh, Lord and Heavenly Father, who relieves those who suffer and soul and body, stretch forth thy hand, we beseech thee, to heal thy servant and ease their pain that by thy mercy they may be restored of body and mind and show forth his thankfulness in love to thee and service to his fellow men and women through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You can improve on a prayer like that. A lot of people say if it's written down in a book, it's not spirit-filled. I say nonsense. It's about the heart. You can pray spontaneously just as deadly as you can read it. If your heart is shut down, you can go through the motion. I've got a lot of good Pentecostal friends, and they tell me people can fake it. You can be spontaneously Pentecostal. Uh, I, I preached in a Pentecostal church once, and somebody came up to me and said, said I want to pray in tongues. And pray for me, I can pray in tongues. 
And he said, they think I am. They think I am. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm praying in Hungarian to fit in. Isn't that amazing? So he's so desperate when I fit in, he prayed in Hungarian. So I went to the back of the church, went to this guy's church, prayed for him. He started speaking to him. I said, you, you're sure that's not Hungarian? He assured me it wasn't. Now, one of the Anglican healing prayers, it specifically talks about preserving me in all goodness. That's what healing is about. Healing is about preservation. How many of you today want to be preserved in all goodness? Yeah. The Holy Spirit is God's great healing preservative. You ever thought of that? The Holy Spirit, preservative, like the word conservative. Some of you may be conservative. It actually means to keep safe from harm. The healing ministry is meant to keep us safe. You know, and we know doctors and the research tells us that if you're full of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness, it's not good for your body. It can take you out. It can knock out your immune system. Today, we need preservation and conservation in the Holy Spirit. That's what today's service is all about. Jesus wants to conserve you and preserve you in both body, mind, and spirit. Healing is not just physical. It involves the whole person. E. Stanley Jones, who in 1930 founded the Christian Ashram Retreat Movement, he started with a healing service in every retreat and a communion service. He did them. <clears throat> And he believed that healing is better when it's indirect. Indirect healing, which means you focus on the spiritual and the emotional first, and the physical follows. And, but a lot of we want the quick fix. We want our physical healing. But Jesus often healed people physically. And he said, stop doing that, or you'll be worse. Physical healing without soul healing. It doesn't really help in the long term, doesn't it? I want to ask you, how many of you know the ancient medical term for anointing with oil? It's the word unction. Sometimes called extreme unction. And it's the Latin word. And what happened in medieval times, by the time the priest got there to do healing oil, they usually died. And so he ended up just, it, it, they stopped thinking of healing, they started thinking of last rites. And I, I've been privileged to do last rites with people who get better and come back to church. That's fun when that happens. It's really fun. I also have a gift of praying for people when it's time for them to die. So talk to me later. <laughs> I've gotten in trouble with that sometimes. Always ask permission first. But the word unctuous in Latin literally means greasy or oily. We're gonna be offering you anointing oil uh, later. And I'll never forget the healing service I went to, led by a blind Anglican healing evangelist. Get that one. A healing evangelist who was blind. And he jokingly called himself Mr. Magoo. He's from California. Yeah, powerful, amazing anointing. He talked about something I'd never thought about, and you may not of yourself. He talked about the healing power of the Eucharist. Many of us, that's not in our category. Uh, I was raised in the England church. In the old days, we had to be confirmed. First, I did it to place my mother, and they built it up, because it was an English Catholic diocese. Communion is everything, and you'll have this amazing experience. So I believed them, and I went up and took communion, 
and it was okay. But it wasn't this amazing experience. I was quite disappointed. And then, later in the Jesus movement, I met Jesus, I went back to the church, had communion again, it had improved. And then, uh, in 1979, when I received the, the gift of tongues, I took communion again, and it improved again. It's really interesting. And what I've learned from that is when we work on our heart, when we surrender our will, when we deal with bitterness and unforgiveness, whatever you need to deal with, communion will improve. It's not that it improves, it's our heart, in our heart, by faith, with thanksgiving. So, the Anglican service says the, in the Catechism that receiving community, its benefit, listen carefully, the strengthening and refreshing of our souls and bodies unto eternal life by the body and blood of Christ. How many of you want that? Yeah, and quite often we just take communion. We don't expect it. Our, our great expectations are not so great. What if we receive communion today as an act of receiving healing in some area in your life? Now, in the first England prayer book, written in 1549, before my time, People were given communion. Uh, saying these words, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer wrote them. And you may have heard these spoken of you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Ever heard those words? Yeah. But many grumbled that this was too Catholic. So they got rid of it. And the next prayer book, written three years later by Archbishop Kremner, it, it, they, they replaced it with, with these, this phrase. You may have heard these. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may have heard that. <clears throat> then King Edward the Sex is an amazing guy. The teenager he died, and his sister Bloody Mary took over. She kicked out the prayer book and burned 300 people at the stake, including Archbishop Thomas Cramner. He was so badly tortured, probably mostly psychologically, that he ended up signing a document to renounce the prayer book that he'd written. So you can imagine the pressure. He was under to make sure he didn't change his mind. They decided to burn him at the stake while he was uh, in good situation. So they burned him at the stake. And as they were burning him, he took his right hand with which he renounced the prayer He stuck it into the fire. He said, with this hand that I've, I renounce my renunciation. So that gives me hopes for Anglican sometimes we're a bit iffy, but if we finish well, that's the important thing. It's interesting. Okay, now, along comes Queen Elizabeth. You all know about Queen Elizabeth II? And Queen Elizabeth, 1558, <clears throat> she brings back the Anglican prayer book, but she did an amazing thing. She brought back both pieces. And so now, yeah, so the whole thing was the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve thy body and soul in terrible last night, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in the heart by faith with thanksgiving. She had the brilliance to integrate, integrate the Catholic and the evangelical in one uh, Eucharist, which is quite the objective. It is the body and blood of Christ spiritually. It's not just a memorial. You actually are receiving Christ spiritually. Uh, but if you don't receive it by faith, with thanksgiving, the prayer book, 39 articles, says you're merely chewing on bread. As St. Augustine said, you are carnally and physically pressing with your teeth. So 
So the problem with communion is guess who? It's us. You know my preferred pronouns? I, me, and myself. Isn't that the problem with being touched, being healed, being fed? It's us. We're, we are a self obsessed culture. What if we'd surrender ourselves? Okay, so I want to ask you a question. How many want communion to improve for you today? I want to receive healing as we see. Now, Jesus came to Bethsaida. Where is that? Uh, northeast Sea of Galilee. They bring a blind man and they beg Jesus to touch him. What did the blind man say? It's not recorded. Other people, sometimes it's other people bringing it to Jesus. Has anybody else brought you to Jesus or to a healing service? Have you ever been brought by Jesus? By others? They can be real help. So Jesus, what does he do? He takes the blind man by the hand. He leads him outside the village. Why did he do that? The answer is, we have no idea. But I'll give you my speculation. I wouldn't be surprised if it was to protect his privacy. Jesus often also removed people from skepticism so they could receive. If you're dealing with people where everybody's negative and doting and critical, it can dampen. You know, it even actually, Jesus sometimes didn't heal many people because their expectations were so low. Now, Jesus spit in the man's eyes and put his hands up. And uh, David, do you want to volunteer? <laughs> That's a joke. Anyways. <laughs> He spit, spitting, why in the world would Jesus spit in somebody's eye? How'd you feel if Bishop Peter spit in your eye as he was over to visit? Welcome to All Saints. <laughs> ah, and another time, he didn't just spit, he mixed it with mud. So I talked to Bishop Peter, and you notice how he's very sensitive to people's preferences, like <laughs> juice, grape juices, wine, gluten free, gluten. So today, we're offering three healing stations. <laughs> one with spit, <laughs> one with mud, and another one with anointing oil. Do I hear the now? <laughs> and then Jesus, he asked a very powerful diagnostic question. What's the question he asked? That's, that's not a bad question. When you're praying for people, you ask them what's happening. What would you like prayer for? What do you need? Sometimes he'd ask, do you want to be well? People often don't. You may not want healing. He's not going to force you. So Jesus is still present today to heal the sick. He is both willing and able to bring wholeness. Remember the leper in Matthew 8, he came up to Jesus. He said, if you are willing, you can heal me. Remember that? What did the leper know for sure? Jesus said he could be healed. He, Jesus was able. He could do it. He had the power. What did he not do? What did he not know? He yeah, are you willing? And the healing ministry comes down essentially to can God do it? And is he, is he willing? And what was Jesus' answer? I will. He never actually turned anyone. Oh, wait, there's a messiness. But he never said, uh, as a matter of fact, if you notice, there are no Christian churches that have prayers for people to get sick. Have you, have you seen a, a sickness service? Because sometimes people believe it's God's will to be sick, but they never pray for it. I don't think people really believe it. People think it's God's will to be sick, they still go to doctors. So we actually know that God wants us whole and well. But you've noticed that all of us die at some point. And if Peter's still your pastor, he'll probably kick your, your, you know, life is messy and we all die. So healing is in that context. So Jesus 
to God. Notice what he says after he got prayer the first time and, and spit. He said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. And this is, this is often true in our lives, not only physically, but also spiritually. Quite often, we're in process, aren't we? We're, how many of you are a mess? How many are broken? Tell me about the other 5% that he talks about. And often, our life, we, we may have some healing, but we're seeing people like trees. Sometimes people, they treat their wife like she's a tree. How many wives like that when he dehumanizes you? Do you like it? No. They don't. Some, people, some bosses treat their employees like trees. They dehumanize them. You know, most wars are started, they, we dehumanize people. In Rwanda, they called the Tutus cockroaches before they slaughtered them. So we need sometimes a second touch, don't we? So we can see people as human, as human, as human. So um, how, many, how many of you know I uh, lost my, my voice for 18 months in 1980? Probably quite a, and my doctor told me I would never preach again. And I ended up having throat surgery and a 24-hour presidential Vancouver General Hospital. My voice came back. It was very quiet and raspy. You couldn't hear me from like 10 feet away. Uh, but I got better and I'm grateful. It gave me a passion for the healing ministry. I joined the Order of St. Luke, the physician, and read everything I could about healing. How many of you have ever been sick? Yeah, does it give you a passion for the healing ministry? How many of you ever had a healing in your life? I mean, want more. Yeah, it's true. So, then Jesus puts his hands on him a second time. He didn't chastise him. He didn't say, boy, you are a tough person to deal with. Go away. I'm going to do it more promising can it. Jesus, he laid his hands on him again. His eyes were open. His sight was start. He saw everything clearly. And, you know, in the Oikos Project, which Peter's going to talk about lately, the key to the Oikos Project, we need our eyes to be open. And we need to see clearly. What do you want, God? We don't want to rush ahead of you. When we're impatient, what do we do? We, we get in the boat without Jesus. We try to fix things. We try to force him to be king. You know, he already is. This Christ, the King Sunday. So I want to ask you this time. i uh, going to be wrapping up soon. Would you like to see more clearly in your life? Do you want Jesus to touch you a second time? Yeah. Let's pray for a moment. Uh, Lord, I'm sensing a lot of people with great expectations, but also people who've been disappointed at times, and they're afraid of being disappointed. Lord, we surrender to you. And we pray, Lord, have your way. Lord, we don't know exactly what you're going to do, but it will be good. And so we surrender to you. In Jesus' name.